Okay, so again, good afternoon, everyone. So for this session, we are going to discuss all about chemistry. And then for tomorrow, we will be dealing with physics. Okay, so let's start. So the first topic is the particulate nature of matter. So in particulate nature of matter, you will be dealing with kinetic particle theory. So as what you know, kinetic particle theory, you have here the solid, the liquid, and the gas. In the exam, they will ask you sometimes to dis, uh, describe. Describe the arrangement, describe the motion, and describe the, the forces between the solid particles, liquid, and gas particles, like that. So as what you can see in solid particles, they are in regular arrangement. We call it lattice lattice arrangement okay and the particles of solid as what you know they just vibrate in place while for liquid as what you can see there is some space and the arrangement of particles are irregular the arrangement of particles are irregular they can slide past through each other unlike the solid they can only vibrate then for gas as what you can see there are a lot of spaces so they can move freely okay then aside from that Aside from the motion, aside from the structure of and arrangement of the particles in solid, liquid, and gas, they will ask you about heat and then energy. Okay, so when you say heat increases, okay, and then energy are gained, this is what's going to happen. From solid, once it increases the heat or it gains energy, there will be a tendency that it will uh, achieve the energy needed to to break the uh, uh, to break the forces of attraction between particles. Okay, so the tendency will be it turns to liquid, and then once you increase again the temperature, once you increase the heat, and it gains more energy, the tendency is that it will turn to gas. Same thing for gas. If it loses energy. If it loses energy, then the tendency will be it turns to liquid. Then it turns back to solid. If it loses energy, and then the, the heat decreases. So that is what's going to happen. Then here are the changes. I saw a lot of questions containing these changes. These are just basic concepts which you should know. Okay. So let's say, for example, from solid to liquid, you know this one is melting. And then liquid to gas, it's vaporization. Then gas to liquid is condensation. Liquid to solid is freezing. Solid to gas is sublimation. Then gas to solid is reverse sublimation. Or sometimes it's written there as deposition. OK? Now, I'm going to show you a question coming from past year paper. So this one is from paper two, February, March 2021. Look at this. This is a paper two question. I'm going to show you how you are going to answer this uh, properly or easily. Even if you don't know that much about the concept, you can easily answer questions like this by using elimination method. So how is that elimination method? Let's say, for example, let's say letter A first. So letter A, it's solid to liquid. Solid to liquid. Is heat given out when solid turns to liquid? No, right. It gains energy, as what I have shown you earlier, it gains energy. So meaning to say this is wrong. So better if you cross it out like that. So meaning to say this choice is wrong. The next is gas to liquid. Heat is taken in. Heat is taken in from gas to liquid. No, right? So it is wrong also. Then solid to gas, you have here heat taken in. Heat is taken in. So that is correct. Okay. So you eliminate A and B already. So you have choices C and D. So gas to solid, heat is taken in, and that is sublimation. So you can get the correct answer for that. You analyze it like that, OK? So that is how you're going to answer questions like this. For paper two, if it's hard for you to understand the question, then look which, uh, or if you don't know really the question, but you have ideas on some choices, you can do the process of elimination. You can eliminate some choices, then you can have the correct one. Okay, there will be higher chance of you for getting the correct answer. Then another question is from paper four. 
So this is October, November 2018, variant 42. Sometimes they'll give you diagrams or figures like this one. Okay? But sometimes they will give you direct questions. Let's say, for example, what process is solid to gas? So they can give you direct question like that. But sometimes they'll give you something like this also. So let's try to analyze this question. Give the scientific name for each of the numbered physical changes. So you know this one already. For one, that is just solid to liquid, so that will be melting. Correct. And then for number two, you have the gas to liquid, so that will be condensation or condensing. Then for number three, liquid to solid, so you have freezing, and then you have number four, which is solid to gas. So that will be sublimation. Again, some questions will ask you directly, like gas to solid or liquid to solid like that. So, but some other questions will ask you like this one. Okay. Then that is for the first one. Next is the heating curve. Okay. If you're going to look at this heating curve, you will see here the solid, the liquid, and the gas. Okay. Then you will see the different phase change that occurs for the solid, liquid, and gas. If you're going to observe this one, you will see a line which is straight during that time when melting and freezing is occurring or occurring. You see this line. This line means it is constant temperature, constant temperature. Even if you add heat, this is still, or the, the temperature is still, is still remain the same. Okay, so it means the temperature is constant during this time. Also, for this one, so during condensation and vaporization, the temperature is constant. It can only change the temperature, let's say, for example, for melting. The temperature will only change if all the solid, if all the solid turns to liquid. So if all the solid turns to liquid, that will be the time when the temperature will increase. But during, during melting, and vaporization or condensation and freezing, the temperature is con constant. It's quite tricky because some students will just simply answer increasing because it's turning solid to liquid, so temperature is increasing, but it's not. During the time of melting and freezing, condensation and va uh, vaporization, the temperature is constant. Okay, you have to remember that. It is adding heat to break the forces of attraction between the particles. So that's the difference on that. Okay. Then if you're going to look at this one, sometimes it is written as this. Sometimes it is written as this one. Okay, like that. So it started from gas, then you have the liquid, then you have the solid like this. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a sample question for this one. So this is from variant 43, May June. The graph shows the change in temperature as a sample of a gas is cool. So meaning to say it started with a gas. Started with a gas, then you have here liquid, then you have solid here. So what do you think is the process occurring at A and B? What do you think? Okay, it is going from, from gas to liquid. So what is that? Okay, so that is condensation. That is from gas to liquid. Look at this. Huh? This one starts from gas. This one starts from gas. And then followed by liquid and then solid. It can be like this also. Okay? Like that. Next. So next one is diffusion. So diffusion, as much you know, is the spreading of one substance through another for from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration due to continuous random motion of particles. So this one is an example of how diffusion occurs. You have here liquid or the water. Then once you put here coloring materials, let's say for example, food color, the food color will spread all throughout the liquid. So that is diffusion. It diffuses, it's spreading from one place to another because of the continuous random motion of the particles. It is always from high concentration to lower concentration. But the thing here is 
This is always the one being asked about diffusion. The factors that affect the rate of diffusion. What are the factors that affect the rate of diffusion? Those are the most common questions, especially for paper two. If you're going to look at the past year paper, they're asking about the factors, how the factors affect the rate of diffusion, like that. Now, let's see this one. So temperature increase, rate of diffusion increases. So meaning to say, when you increase the temperature, the rate of diffusion will be faster. Okay, the, the diffusion will be faster, like that. Because the particles will move faster also. That's why it can spread easily. The next is molecular mass increases, rate of diffusion decreases. Because if the molecular mass increases, it will become uh, heavier like that. So it is harder for it to spread because it's heavier compared to substances with which has low molecular mass. Now, here is the question that you can see for uh, diffusion. So this one is variant 20, uh, 21, paper 2, October, November 2020. So which gas has the lowest rate of diffusion? So you expect that if it's lowest rate, it has the lowest temperature, the one that has the lowest temperature, the one that has the lowest temperature. Okay, but in here, temperature is not given. Temperature is not given. So what you need to do here is to identify the molecular mass of each given here or of each choices. So let's try to identify which one. So hydrogen, you have two hydrogen here times one, which is the atomic mass, so that is two. You have to compare. This is 14 plus three times one, so this will be 17, okay? The one that has the highest molecular mass will be spreading slower, okay? So it will be the slowest. So you have to identify which has the highest molecular mass. So this one is 12 plus four times one, so this will be 16. And then for carbon dioxide, let's have 12, then oxygen is two times 16. So this will be 44, so this will be 44. So the one that has the highest molecular mass, the one that has the highest molecular mass will be diffusing slowest. So the answer is letter D. But if temperature is given, if temperature is given, so you expect that the one that has the lowest temperature will diffuse slowest, okay? But for this one, you have to analyze, you have to know which one has the lowest or which one has the highest molecular mass. Okay, so that is for diffusion. Now, let's proceed to the next topic, experimental techniques. So for this experimental technique, of course, you should know the different apparatus. Okay, you should know the different apparatus that you will use to measure different variables. So let's say, for example, time. So it's basic, stopwatch and then clock. Then temperature is for thermometer, like that, and then mass for balance. Okay. Aside from this measurement, you also have to know the different methods of separating mixtures. So different methods of separating mixtures. So we have here evaporation, filtration, simple distillation, fractional distillation, and then chromatography. So these are the five uh, separating mixtures that you have that you have to know. Okay. Then let's see a question about this one. The most common question about this is like about chromatography. Okay, about chromatography. So let's see how you're going to answer questions like this. In the chromatography experiment shown, which label rep represents the solvent front? If you're going to look at this one, this chromatography experiment, you will see a shaded area here. This shaded area here is the solvent. This shaded area here is the solvent. This is the baseline. This is the baseline. Baseline is always above above the solvent or above the liquid, okay? Then these are the spots that you can see for the, uh, for the chromatography okay, experiment. Now, which one shows the solvent front? So the solvent front here is the letter A. It means th that is the part wherein the solvent can tra uh, travel, okay? So that is letter A. 
until that part the solvent rich okay then another one is this one chromatography can be used to test the purity of substances the diagram shows the chromatogram of a soldered substance so this is a paper for question now look at this one this is a bit complicated for the students already i mean the second question but the first one of course it's easy how does this chromatogram show that this substance is not pure so you can say that this is not pure because it has two spots correct Jingyao. so it has two spots so you can say that this is not pure so it has two substances present there okay and then look at this one draw a circle around the correct rf value for the spot labeled x for the spot labeled x so for this one you have to identify the rf value and you should be familiar with the formula of that you should be familiar with it with the formula of rf or retention factor so retention factor is just height of solute over height of solvent okay in actual exam in actual exam this is what you're going to do since you are allowed to use ruler you can just simply use ruler to measure this because no measurement is given on the figure no measurement is given on the figure so what you need to do is to measure it by yourself using ruler so let's try to measure this one using ruler okay so, so we have here a ruler okay you're going to start measuring it from this baseline or starting line or start line like that then here you can see it is four and then the solvent is five so for you to solve this rf or retention factor it's just rf equals four for the solute over five which is the solvent so rf is equal to 0 0.8 so rf is equal to 0 0.8 if no value is given if no value is given meaning to say you have to measure it by yourself you have to measure it by yourself like that okay do you have any questions so far no okay so since you don't have question let's proceed to the next to the next one teacher rf value always less than zero yes it's always less than zero because the ink or the color will just be always under the solvent it's always under the solvent so that's why it's always less than zero okay and it's just this dice this dice this color is just traveling together with the solvent together with the solvent so it cannot pass through the solvent it's just going with that okay next so next topic will be atoms elements and compounds so for atoms elements and compounds they will just ask you to identify the proton neutrons and electrons protons neutrons and electrons so relative charge is easy so proton positive neutron is zero electron is negative one then for the mass it's one for proton one for neutron and sometimes this is given as one over 1800 if you write there 1000 a one over 1800 that will be acceptable for the atomic mass okay then next will be like this one for paper for, uh, for paper for question look at this aside from identifying the electrons neutrons and protons of an atom sometimes they will ask you about ion and then also isotope okay now look at this question chlorine is in group seven of the periodic table two isotopes of chlorine are chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 you know the meaning of isotopes right same number of protons but different number of neutrons okay now let's try to answer this state why these two isotopes of chlorine have the same chemical properties why do they have the same chemical property the reason is that it will never be about the proton it will never be about the neutron and it's not just about the electron it's not just about the electron it is or it should be like this they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell if you are just going to write same number of electrons you will only get one mark you will only get one mark okay it's two marks right 
So for you to get through too much, you should include in their outer shell. In their outer shell. But remember this class, huh? remember this. Not only for chlorine, not only for isotopes of the uh, same uh, element, not only for the same element. Also different elements. Let's say, for example, sodium, potassium. They are different elements, but they have the same chemical property. Why do they have the same chemical property? Same reason. They have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. Because they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. So meaning to say, elements in the same group have the same chemical property because they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. Let's say, for example, group one. So elements in group one have one electrons in their outer shell. So they have the same chemical property. Elements in group seven, they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell. So they have the same chemical property. Okay. Then two, complete the table to show the number of electrons, neutrons, and protons in each atom. Look at this one. Each atom. And then ion. When you said atom, it means it is neutral. Atom is neutral. Meaning to say proton, if it's neutral, proton is equal to electron. If it's atom, proton is equal to electron. But when you said ion, it's not equal. They are not equal. It has charge. It has charge. Okay. Meaning to say, if it has charge, the proton, proton and electron are not equal. Equal. They are not equal because they have charge. Okay. It could be positive or it could be negative charge. Okay, so that's the difference between atom and ion. Now, if you're going to look at this one, chlorine 3517, I gave you two examples, not only atom, not only ion, for you to know what's the difference. So for chlorine, as much you can see, it is atom because it doesn't have charge. This is atom, it doesn't have charge. The electrons is the same as the proton. So if the proton is 17, because proton will never change, Proton will never change. It's always the atomic number. It's always the atomic number. So it's 17. If it's atom, it is also 17 because it's equal. Proton and electron is equal. Then the neutron, for you to get the neutron, you just have to subtract. It will just be 35 minus 17 equals 18. Okay, it will be 18. Always remember that the proton is always equal to the atomic number. Always atomic number. Okay. Now, next one. This one is ion. This one is ion because it has charge. Right. Now, if you're going to look at this one, as I've told you earlier, 17, it is the number of proton. It's always the atomic num number, the number of proton. So it's 17. Okay. And then, since it has charge, it has charge here. It, it's negative. It means it gain electron. It means it gain electron. Okay. How many electrons? It depends on the charge. Since the charge is negative, it means it gain one electron. It gain one electron. So if it gain one electron from 17, it will become 18. And then the neutron will be the same. It will be 37 minus 17. So you'll get. 20. So that is how you get the neutron. Okay, so don't be confused in this. Atoms and ions. Atom, proton is equal to electron. It's neutral. But ion, it has charge. So if it has charge like this one, it means it is ion. The proton electrons are not equal. Okay, so if it's negative, it means it gains electron. Okay, next, let's proceed to the next one. So this is uh, quite complicated, so I want you to see, but it's just about that only. So when you say an ion, it means it is ne negative charge. It is negative charge. How do you know if it's negative charge? It means it has more proton, uh, more electron than proton. So it means it has more electron than proton. Now you're going to look here on the on the table which has more electrons 
Let's see. One, zero, so this is not the answer. Six, six, they are the same. Six, six, 10, 10, six, 18. So look at letter E. Letter E, it has more electrons. So it means it is an ion. So for this one, it will be letter E. Like that, because it has more electrons. Okay, look at the other. Look at the others. This is equal, so this strong, this is strong. It is equal, it has more protons, so it's not the answer. So the answer is letter E. Okay, don't guess this, this kind of question, huh? don't guess this kind of question because some students, the tendency will be they'll just guess because they don't know how to answer. You see, these are, these are so many items, so many marks. So you have to know this one. Next is cation. Cation, it means positive charge. It is positive charge. If it's positive charge, it means more proton. It has more proton than electron. It has more proton than electron. Okay, so if you're going to take a look at this one, you should see. So you have two answers. You have two answers for this one. Letter A, it has more proton than electron. So letter A. Then let's see one more. So this is the same. The same, the same, the same. So this is not the same, the same, the same. So the answer is letter I. Okay, the other one is letter I. Okay. So just like that, you have to analyze. Okay, so that's how you're going to answer this one. You just have to analyze. Then noble gases. So you know, you expect this is from group eight. You have the periodic table, so you can just simply identify. Noble gases, group eight. Then halogen, group seven. Group seven, then it's a group one atom. So group one, group one atom. So you have to analyze which one is a group one atom. Atom means same, same number of protons and same number of, I mean, same proton and electron numbers. Okay, so you have to analyze it like that. Since periodic table is given, you can easily answer this one. Next, ions and ionic bonds. Ions. So chemical bonds are formed by transferring electrons from one atom to another. They are transferring the electrons. That's why they have, or they, get, they are getting charged. So I'm just going to show you example for this one. The most common question. Let's say, for example, you have sodium and chlorine. Then they will ask you, write the ionic bonding or draw the, uh, the ionic bonding between sodium and chlorine. Sometimes it is not given. Okay, sometimes these figures is not given. You have to analyze on your own. You just have to remember that elements in group one, these are the thing you have to remember here, group and then charge. Group and then charge, okay? Group one, two, three, then five, six, seven. For group one, you know the charge will be positive. For group two, the charge will be two plus. You have periodic table, so you can easily analyze this. Three plus. Group five is three minus. Group six is two minus. Then group seven is one minus or minus. Like that. And this number represents this number represents the number of electrons in the outer shell. That is the one you're going to write there. Okay, the group number. I mentioned that earlier. But the charge. You have to look at the periodic table also. You have to identify the group number, and this will be the charge of this of those atoms when they turn to ion. Group one positive, group two, two plus, group three, three plus, five, three minus, six, two minus, seven is just minus. Okay, so you can use the periodic table to analyze that. Now, here's an example of the question. Magnesium oxide or MgO is formed when magnesium burns in oxygen. Complete the dot and cross diagram to show the electron arrangement of the ion. I saw this kind of question many times in paper four. Okay, so you have to know how to do this. You, you, you can get three marks for this one, for this easy question. Look, you just have to draw one circle. Okay, you just have to draw one circle for each. Then look at the periodic table. You have to look at the periodic table for you to know the charge. So you have to put here that 
Why do we have to put dots here? Because in this case, they use dots for magnesium. Sometimes they will use X for that. Okay, but in this case, they use that. So we have to use that. Okay, we have to use that like this. So you have to put eight that on that. Now look at magnesium. Magnesium is group two. If you're going to look at the periodic table, magnesium is group two. So it means it will lose two electrons. It will lose two electrons. It is group two. What will be the charge of magnesium? What will be the charge of magnesium? If it's from group two, Okay, just write there 2 plus. Simple as that. It is from group 2. You see in the periodic table, group 2 lose 2 electrons, so the charge will be 2 plus. Then for oxygen, oxygen is group 6. So you have to put 6x for oxygen because it's group 6, just like that. Then you have to put 2 dots. The 2 dots from magnesium will be transferred here. You have to put that dot like this, two dots. Okay, and the charge will be two minus. It gained two electrons, so the charge will be two minus. Okay, because it's group six, group six, it gained two electrons, so the charge will be two minus. And next question about this one. Do you have any question about this? No, so this one is clear. Now, write the chemical equation for the reaction, of course, when magnesium burns in oxygen. Look at this one. Chemical equation. Equation, so you, uh, chemical equation, so you have to write symbols. Okay? Some of the students are just writing words. If you write words there, it will not be acceptable. You look at that question, uh, it could be chemical equation or word equation. So for this one, they are asking you to draw or to write the chemical equation. So magnesium, Mg. Then oxygen is diatomic, so you have to put O2. Okay, O2. And then the product will be MgO. MgO like that. It is two marks, so you have to balance. So you have to put two in front of this and then two in front of Mg. Why do I have to put two in front? I, I mean two in oxygen. Why do you have to put O2 there? Because it is diatomic molecule or diatomic molecule. Like H2, H2, N2, O2, Cl2, F2, Br2, I2, like that. Okay, so it should be written as O2. Next, molecules and covalent bonds. So this one, they are sharing electrons. So for this one, they are sharing electrons to become stable. So it depends also on how many electrons they are going to share. And remember that covalent bonds occurs only for two nonmetals between nonmetals. Ionic is for metals and nonmetals. Covalent is for nonmetals. And they are going to share electrons. They are going to share electrons. Okay. How are you going to present sharing of electrons? So it's like this one. So complete the dot and cross diagram to show the electron arrangement in a molecule of carbonyl chloride and show the outer shell electrons only. If you're going to look at fluorine, fluorine is group seven. It is group seven. So how many electrons it has? It has okay, seven electrons in the outer shell. In outer shell. Then for carbon, it is group four. So it has four electrons in the outer shell. Okay, then for elements with seven electrons in the outer shell, they only need to share one, share one electron. They only need to share one electron. For carbon, it's group four. It needs to share four electrons. It needs to share four electrons. So like that. So each Fluorine should have seven, and they're going to share one. Each carbon, or for the carbon, they're going to share four, and it has four electrons. So let's do for fluorine. Fluorine going to share one, so you just have to put one, one, like that. Okay, then for oxygen, let's have oxygen. So oxygen is group six. 
oxygen is group six, so it has six electrons in the outer shell. Then it means it needs to share two electrons. Share two electrons because it should be eight. They should they should have eight. Okay, so fluorine should have one electron to share, and then the rest will be outside. The rest will be outside like this. Okay, the rest will be outside like this. Okay, they're just sharing one. One will be inside because it is going to share one. Then for the carbon, it has four. So one will be shared here. We will use that for carbon. One should be shared here. One should be shared here. And then two should be shared here. How do I know which one will receive one, which one will receive two or will share two? You have to look at the bond. Look at this. Single bond, so it means one electron each. This one is double bond, so it means they are sharing two electrons each. So two for carbon and two also for oxygen, like this one. But oxygen has six electrons in the outer shell. So you have to add four more outside for the oxygen. So it should be like this. This one, you see, it is three mic. So this one is three mic. Okay, this is how you'll get the four mic. If you're not going to write these electrons outside the outside this one, you only get one mic. Okay. So you have to show the complete electrons for each element included in this. Each atom included for this one. Okay. Then let's proceed to the next one. Okay, for the stoichiometry. So for stoichiometry, you should look at the equation first. Okay, the equation should be balanced before you proceed to the computation. It should be balanced. Balanced equation means they have the same number of pro, uh, they, they have the same number of atoms of each kind in the reactants and in the product or in the product side. Okay. But aside from that, this kind of question is mostly asked. For this topic, they're going to ask you about empirical formula. And I'm going to show you how you're going to answer this kind of question. This is just easy one. Okay, but when students look at it, oh, so hard. So how can we answer this one? So look at this one. You can follow this step. First thing you need to do is to write the atoms present. A compound contains 85.7% carbon. So you have to put carbon first, then followed by 14.3% hydrogen. So you have to put here hydrogen like this. It's a very common question. But when I look at students' answer, they're skipping this. They, because they don't have any idea on how to answer this one. So look, first thing, you write the element. Then followed by the percentage. You convert it into mass. So you can just simply write the 85.7. Then for hydrogen, it is 14.3. And after that, divide with the atomic mass. Yes, correct. Uh, you just have to divide with the atomic mass. 87 divided by 12. Then for hydrogen, it will be 14.3 divided by 1. So you can divide now. You can have at least three decimal places to make your answer more accurate. So 85.7 divided by 12. So that will be 7.3. 1, 4, 2. Okay. And the other one will be 14.3. Just have to divide it by 1. And then after this, you have to divide it with the lower value. Lower value. So since this one is the lower value, 7.142, let's divide it with 7.142. 7.142. It is lower value, right? So you have to divide it with the lower value, 1, 4, 2. The next will be 14.3 divided by 7.142. Then you can get the answer for this one. So this will be 1. This will be 2. Okay, this will be 2. Now you can get the correct answer. It means it has 1 carbon, 2 hydrogen. So it's just CH2. CH2. 
So step one, write the element, write the percent, divide with atomic mass. Then after you divide with atomic mass, you look at the lower value, then you can get the number of atoms for each. Okay, for this one. Okay, then the molecular mass of the compound is 112. Calculate the molecular formula of this compound. Empirical formula is the simplest, simplified formula. Okay, it is a simplified formula. Molecular formula is showing the actual number of the atoms in the molecule. So how are we going to do this? The first thing you need to do is to identify the MR, molecular mass of CH2. So molecular mass of CH2 is 12 plus 2 times 1. So this will be 14. Then after that, you divide the mass of the compound. So 112 divided by 14. Then you'll get 112 divided by 14, you'll get 8. Okay, so that will be 8. And then you have here the empirical formula, CH2. So you have C and then H. C is 1, hydrogen is 2. So you can multiply it with C, multiply it with 8. And then for hydrogen, you multiply it with 8. Then you can get the, num the actual number. So this will be 8. This will be 16. That will be 16. So the formula will be C, 8, and then H, 16. So this is the molecular formula. Any question about Is there any question about this one? Okay, everything clear? Okay, let's proceed to the next one. Next. Okay, so here are the formulas you have to remember. Just few formulas only for number of moles, moles in gases, and then concentration. I have given you this several times before. So number of moles, it's just number of moles equals mass over molecular mass. Or simply, you can just write the N equal to M over MR. Then for the volume of the uh, molten gas, it's just V is equal to N times 24. Okay, but you have to be careful on this. It should always be in dm cube. It should always be in dm cube. Then the concentration is concentration over number of moles. Uh, concentration equals number of moles over volume. So that is C is equal to N divided by V. Same thing, it should be in dm cube, always in dm cube. Even if it's gas, even if it's in concentration, they will require you to convert that into dm cube. Okay, so let's proceed. So for this one, calculate the volume of chlorine gas in cm cube that reacts to form 2.34 grams of NaCl. So the first thing you need to do here, let's write the formula. We have N is equal to M over MR. Then we have uh, volume of gas. If for gas, it is N times 24. Then for concentration, it is N over MR, like this one. Okay. So the first thing you need to do here, since you are asked to identify First, the moles of NaCl. You have to get the moles of NaCl because mass is given. Mass is given. So you can use this formula. N is equal to M over MR. It's about moles and mass. Moles and mass. Correcting you. It's moles and mass, so you have to use this formula. Now, we have to identify first the MR. MR of NaCl. So MR of NaCl is equal to Na is 23 plus Cl is 35.5. So this will be 23 plus 35.5 equals 58.5. So this is 58.5. 58.5. Okay, you have to include the decimal. 
And then you can solve now the number of moles. So N is equal to the mass 2.34 divided by the MR 58.5. So N will be solved 2.34 divided by 58.5. This will be 0 0.04. Okay, very good, everyone. 0 0.04. Okay, so this is the moles NaCl. The next thing will be you have to identify the moles of chlorine gas, Cl2. Okay, this is about moles, moles to moles. Okay, this is moles to moles. So what you need to do is to identify the mole ratio because it is. Like this one. Let me write 0 0.04 moles NaCl. How many moles of Cl2 is that? Moles Cl2. So what you need here is mole ratio. Mole ratio from the equation. The mole ratio there is one mole of Cl2 equals two moles NaCl. Okay, it means in every one mole of Cl2, it will produce two moles of NaCl. Okay, so we can do this one 0 0.04 times the mole ratio. Mole ratio is one mole Cl2, Cl2. Let's write this one moles NaCl. So one mole Cl2 over two moles NaCl. Two moles. NaCl. So you can get the moles of NaCl. So it's just divided by two. Multiply by one, divided by two. So we get 0 0.02 moles NaCl. Okay. You multiply by one and then you divide it by two. That is the mole ratio. This one. Okay. The next, you can now identify. The volume, it is moles volume of gas, volume of gas, of gas. So the formula, uh, what you can see there, it's just V is equal to N times 24. So volume is equal to moles 0 0.02 times 24. So this will be V equals to 0 0.02 times 24, you'll get 0 0.48, 0 0.48 dm cube. You see, this is dm cube. But the question is asking in cm cube, in cm cube. So you have to convert that into cm cube. So how are you going to do that? You just multiply by 1,000. V is equal to 0 0.0, I mean 0 0.48 times 1,000. So V will be equal to 480 cm cube. So the answer will be 480 cm cube. Teacher, 0 0.2 moles is chlorine there. Yes, it's chlorine now. Okay, so next, let's proceed to the next topic. Okay, electricity and chemistry. So for electricity and chemistry, most of the time they will ask you, what is electrolysis? Like that, okay? When they ask questions about electricity and chemistry, most of the questions ask first about the definition of elect uh, electrolysis. So when you said electrolysis, it is the decomposition or breaking down of an electrolyte, molten or aqueous with the help of electricity. Okay, so you have to know that also. Okay, so we'll just proceed to the question. I'm going to give you how you're going to answer this one. I'm going to tell you. So this one is paper four, October, November, 2019. If you still remember, when we're discussing this kind of question, electrolysis, I always ask you to write the ions present first. Okay, the ions present in the electrolyte. So let's see this one. A student used the following apparatus to electrolyze concentrated aqueous sodium chloride. So this one is concentrated 
AQ sodium chloride. So the first thing I want you to do to answer this kind of question, I want you to write the ions present. AQ, so meaning to say it has H plus and OH minus. AQ means it is uh, containing water. It is dissolved in water. Concentrated, it means the concentration is high. Okay. Then sodium, Na plus, then Cl minus. In this case, you can answer the question easily. Okay, if you know the ions present, then it will be easier for you to answer the question. Look at this one. Suggest the name of a metal used or metal which could be used as an inert electrode. Do you still remember the answer for this one? You see this word inert electrode, inert electrode. Before you are answering graphite, graphite. Most of the most of you write graphite, but if they ask you to write inert, inert, it means unreactive electrode, unreactive electrode. You should write there platinum. If you write graphite, it will not be acceptable. You should put there platinum because graphite is uh, somewhat reactive, but they are asking about inert. Inert means unreactive electrode. So the unreactive electrode is platinum. Okay. The name the gas formed at the positive electrode. So look at this one. What is the gas form at the positive electrode? Okay, positive electrode. What is positive electrode? Okay, the anode. So this one will receive the, or will get, which one? Okay, chlorine gas, so chlorine. So this will, the chlorine because it is asking about positive electrode so positive electrode will attract a negative it will attract a negative ion so it is cl because it is concentrated okay because it is concentrated now write the half ionic equation for the reaction according to the negative electrode so the negative electrode it will be hydrogen okay it will be hydrogen because sodium is more reactive than hydrogen so hydrogen will be the one that will be produced. So how are you going to write that? Okay, so let's write the answer for the one. Include the state symbol. It says include the state symbol. It is for three marks. So include state symbol. If you're not going to write the state symbol, you only get two marks for this one. Okay, so three marks, you have to write the state symbol. That is H plus, because it's hydrogen, then H plus here is aqueous. It is in aqueous. Okay, stay. Then plus electron. Then it will produce. What will be the product? Okay, very good. H2. It is diatomic molecule, so you have to put H2. Then this is a gas. H2 is a gas, so you have to put gas. Now look at this. Hydrogen is the diatomic molecule. This is the crucial part for this one. You see H2, right? It's diatomic molecule. So you have to put two in front of AQ. I mean two in front of H plus. Since it has two H plus, you also have to put two in front of E. Okay, very good. So two H plus, that's AQ. And then two electrons, it will produce H2. H2 because it is a diatomic molecule. Clear? Okay, next. So next one is refining metal. Refining means purifying, purifying impure metal. Because when you, uh, when you mine, when you get the ore of substances, there are different impurities. There are other substances attached to that. It's not pure. Most of the time, it's impure metal from the ore. So you'll get the ore of that, then there will be a way on how you can get the pure, or there will be a way for you to re refine the metal. So this is how you're going to do it for this one. This is purifying impure metal. You have to remember that in cathode, it is the one that contains the pure metal in cathode. In anode, this, this is impure metal. 
then the electrolyte that we're going to use is the aqueous solution of the metal. The aqueous solution of the metal. I'm going to show you a question about this one. So this is a paper for question. Okay. Peter, can this meeting be able to watch after after Yes, of course, Aiden. Okay, so look at this one. Copper is refined, purified by electrolysis. Nickel can be refined using similar method. This is the problem in for some students. They see the word copper. So what they're going to do is that they will use copper, copper, copper. Everything will they will just simply write copper. You read the question properly. You finish reading the question first. Okay. Even if you know how to answer, but if you did not analyze the question, for sure you'll get the wrong answer. Okay. So copper is refined or purified by electrolysis. And then nickel can be refined using similar method. So the diagram shows refining of nickel. So this one is about refining of nickel by electrolysis. What does the question ask? I, what does this uh, topic shows you or shows earlier? Cathode contains pure metal. Anode contains impure metal. So at the cathode, at the cathode you will put here pure nickel. If they write their nickel, so you will put their impure whatever. Pure copper, pure gold, pure nickel, whatever metal they are going to ask you to uh, purify using this kind of or this process. So at the anode, you will put here impure nickel. It's always like that. You can put copper, you can put gold if the question is asking about copper or gold. Then next will be elect electrolyte. So electrolyte, it's aqueous solution of whatever uh, nickel salt. So you can put there AQ solution, solution of, you can write nickel sulfate, nickel chloride, whatever. As long as it is salt of nickel. So AQ nickel chloride, you can write like this. Okay. Need to include AQ, no need. You can put just, or you can just simply put nickel chloride like that. Next, indicate by writing N on the diagram where nickel is formed. Nickel will be formed here at the cathode. Like that. Why? Because this is the impure nickel, impure nickel. So the nickel here, the nickel here will be going to the electrolyte. And then since it is nickel is metal, it will be, or it is a positive charge ion. So the positive charge ion will be attracted to the negative electrode. So nickel will be attached to the negative electrode because it is positive ion. Okay. Next, the extraction of aluminum. Okay, so the main ore of aluminum is bauxite. It has high melting point. Now let me see if you still remember this one. This is question I saw a lot or said several times in different papers. Aluminium is extracted by electrolysis. Iron is extracted from its ore by reduction with carbon. So as what you can see here, as I told you earlier, first question, they will ask you about electrolysis. What is meant by electrolysis? So electrolysis, breaking down of molten aqueous ionic compound or molten or aqueous ionic compound by the passage of electricity. This is two marks, two marks. How will you get the two marks? It is breaking down of molten ionic compound then by the passage or by using electricity. Okay, then name the main ore of aluminum. What is the ore of aluminum? Okay, so bauxite. Explain why. Now let me see. Explain why aluminum cannot be extracted by reduction with carbon. Why it cannot be extracted by reduction with carbon? If you still remember this one, the reactivity series, this is that calling me a cute zebra. I like her call smart goat, smart goat. Here is aluminum, here is aluminum, here is carbon. So as what you can see, aluminum is higher than carbon in reactivity series. So you cannot use reduction with carbon to extract aluminum because it is more reactive than carbon. Correct, it is more reactive than carbon. 
Okay. Then describe the role of cryolite. So the cryolite is to reduce the melting point. Correct, Ikling. To reduce the melting point of the aluminum or of the compound of this aluminum. Next, name the product form of the positive electrode. Again, as I've told you, electrolysis. Write the ions present. Write the ions present. What are the ions present? It is aluminum. It is Al2O3. It is Al2O3, right? So Al, it is group 3. So it will be 3 plus. Oxygen is group 6. So it is O2 minus. Name the product form of the positive electrode. Positive electrode. So in the positive electrode, oxygen will be attracted because it is negative charge. Oxygen will be attracted here. It is positive, so it will attract negative charge. So O2. For that, the gas that will be formed here will be oxygen. Look at this one. Name. If you write the O or O2, that or yeah. If you write O or O2, it will be wrong. You have to write the name. Next, write the ionic half equation at the negative electrode. At the negative electrode, the one that will be attracted there or produced there will be the Al3 plus because it's positive. Okay, so if you're going to write the equation, it will be Al3 plus plus three electrons will produce aluminum or Al. Look at this one. Three plus. You know already it is group three. So you know the charge, three plus. So you need to add three electrons to make it stable. Any question about this one? Again, if it's electrolysis, better if you're going to write the ions present. If you know what are the ions present, then you will know which one will be attracted to which, okay? Then you know the charge, you know the charges. Group one, positive. Group two, two plus. Group three, three plus, like that. Or you said, can I write boiling? No, cannot. Cannot write boiling. It should be low melting point, less energy will be needed, so you can do it like that. The last question is confusing for you. Okay, now I'm going to show you why is it Al3 plus. Al, let's write the ions present. Uh, the ions present are Al3 plus and then O2 minus. Do you know why is it Al3 plus? Do you know why is it Al3 plus? Okay, correct. Because it's group three. Very good. It is group three. So it is three plus. It will lose three electrons, so it will be Al3 plus. Now, for you to balance it, for you to make it stable, I mean, for you to, to balance that, you need three electrons to make it balanced. Three plus, it means it, lose, it needs three electrons to be balanced. So three plus plus three electrons, then it will produce Al. If the confusing part here is which one will be attracted to which, is you have to look at the charge. Positive will be attracted to negative. Negative will be attracted to positive. Okay, next. Okay, next. Chemical energetic. So energetic of a reaction. It could be exothermic or it could be endothermic. Okay, for bond breaking, it is endothermic. For bond making, it is exothermic. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the most common question asked for this one. Look, they are go they're going to give you structures like this one of reactants and then product. And then you have to identify what are the energies or how much energies are involved for the reactant and for the product. How are you going to identify that? Most of you, this is what you're going to do. You're going to count how many carbon, hydrogen bond, carbon, hydrogen bond, carbon, carbon bond, like that. It's okay also, it's correct also. But I'm going to show you a simple technique on how you can answer this easily. Look at the first question. Same bond energies are shown, or some bond energies are shown in the table. 
Calculate the energy change for the reaction between propene and fluorine using the following step. Calculate the energy needed to break bonds. Energy needed to break bonds, it is referring to the reactant. It's always first the reactant. It's always the reactant first. But I'm going to show you to make it simple. Look at the bonds present on the reactant and product. Look at the bonds present in the reactant and product. If they have the same bonds, you can cancel it. Let's say, for example, this is hydrogen here, hydrogen here. They are the same, so you can cancel it. CH bond, CH bond, CH bond, CH bond. You can cancel it. CH bond, CH bond. Then CH, 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 CH. Then CC, then CC. Like that. You can cancel it. So you can see the remaining bonds and you can make the computation easier. You can make the computation easier if you're going to do that. Because what you're going to do is that you're going to compute. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry about that. Hello everyone, can you hear me again? Yes. Okay, thank you. So now again, you just have to cancel the ones that are the same for all. Let's say, for example, H, CH, 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 CH. If they are the same, you can just simply cancel it. Okay? You can just simply cancel it. Then you have H here, and then H here. Then C, C. So you only have here C, double bond C, which is one, and then CL, single bond CL, which is also one. So you can easily solve this question. Okay, and then for the product, let's write here so that it will be easier later for you. So let's write C bond C and then C bond CL, which is two. One, and then this is two. Okay, so let's solve. So for the first one, calculate the energy needed to break bonds. So energy needed to break bonds, those are the ones present in the reactant. Okay. So there is one C double bond C and one CL bond CL. So you just have to multiply it with the energy present there on the table. So CL bond C double bond C one times six one two. So you just have to multiply it with six one two. So this will be 612. Then CL bond CL, so this will be times CL bond CL, that is 242. 
So which is equal to 2, 4, 2. Now you can solve it easily. You just have to add 6, 1, 2 plus 2, 1, uh, 2, 4, 2. Then you'll get the answer. Okay. So 6, 1, 2 plus 2, 4, 2. You'll get 8, 5, 4. So 8, 5, 4. So the answer will be 8, 5, 4. Just like that. You simplify it. You simplify it. And you can get the correct answer already. Okay? Because the tendency of the students will just uh, compute everything. They will see their CH bond, so they just compute it. So for this one, the answer is 854. So let's try it here on the side. 854. 854. Okay. So we can this one. Let's proceed to the next one. Next one is energy release when bonds are formed. Energy release when bonds are formed. So you have to write the other one. So it is C, C, F, uh, C, 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 single bond C. Let's write this. C, single bond C. So you have one times three, four, seven. So that will be three, four, seven. Then C, bond C, L. You have two times C, bond C, L. You have three, three, nine. So you just multiply it by 2. You can get 2 times 339 equals 678. So 678. Then add. Get the total. 347 plus 678. You'll get 1025. So this is 1025. So for this one, you'll get 1025. Okay, 1025. Now calculate the energy change energy change for the reaction between propene and chlorine. For this one, you have to make it like this. Reactant minus product. The energy we solve for the reactant, you subtract the energy you get from the product. So 854 minus 1025. Then you'll get the correct answer. So 854 minus 1025, you'll get Negative 171. Negative 171. Okay, so that's the answer. So for you to make it easy or easier, you cancel the bonds that are different because it will not be affected. If you're going to look, if you're going to look at the uh, marking scheme, that is correct also. They will give you two answers. One is the one which has the higher value, computed everything, and one with the lower value. That is they cancel the bonds that are the same. So it will be okay also. It will be fine also. They will give you marks on that. But actually, those bonds will not be affected. Those bonds will not be affected. The actual thing is that these bonds here, these bonds here will not be affected. It will not be affected. It will not break. Okay, you see, because they are the same, it will not break. The only bond that will change is this bond here and the bond here. Okay, that, those are the only bonds that will change. So you can compute it as simple as that. But if you're going to look at the marking scheme, yeah, they'll give you marks on that. But easier if you're going to cancel the bonds that are the same. You understand, Janiao? Okay, so let's proceed to the next one. Sorry, we lagged. So I think it will extend a bit. So chemical reaction. Collision theory. So for this one is the collision theory. Can I go back? You want to screenshot? It will be recorded so you can watch next time. Okay. okay. Again, collision theory. Collisions are needed for a chemical reaction to take place. So there will be no chemical reaction if there is no collision. Okay. So successful collisions have enough activation energy. Remember this, uh, Chemical reactions only happen because there is enough energy or act, uh, energy to reach the activation energy. Activation energy means the energy needed for the chemical reaction to occur. Okay, so not all collisions will be successful to make chemical reaction. It needs to reach activation energy. Okay, now let's look at this one. When you said chemical reaction, of course, there are things that when you add together, there will be chemical reaction. 
There are also things that when you add together, there will be no chemical reaction. How are you going to know that? How are you going to know that? For you to identify that, you have to know the reactivity of different substances. For metals, they usually use this. Please stop calling me a cute zebra. I like her call smart coat. For metals, they are usually using this. More reactive is the one above, like that. And then next will be for the halogen. Halogen is like this. Chlorine, chlorine, bromine, and then iodine. The most reactive here is chlorine. Okay, you have to remember this. Huh? Reactivity increases. Reactivity increases. So the one on top is the most reactive. The one on top is the most reactive. Now let's take a look at this one. Chlorine and then potassium iodide. Chlorine and potassium iodide. We are going to put X if, it, if there's no reaction. We're going to put check if there's a reaction. Chlorine and potassium iodide. Look at this one. Here is iodine. And then here is chlorine. Here is chlorine. As what you can see, chlorine is more reactive, right? Chlorine is more reactive. So there will be reaction, correct? So there will be reaction for this one. Chlorine will replace the iodine. Chlorine will replace the iodine because it is more reactive. The one that you add is more reactive. That's why it can remove the other one. Okay. The next is bromine and potassium chloride. Bromine and potassium chloride. You look at this one. Potassium chloride, chlorine is here, bromine is here. Is, is bromine able to remove chlorine? Okay, very good. No reaction. No, cannot. Because chlorine is more reactive. So you have to analyze it. Same goes here. Same goes with the metal. Same goes with the metal. The one on top is the most reactive. The one on top can replace the one below. It can replace the one below in the compound. So that is how it is. The more reactive substance can replace the less reactive substance if they are going to combine together. Okay, so potassium iodide, bromine, bromine is here. It is more reactive than iodine, so there will be reaction. Iodine and then chlorine. Iodine is less reactive, so no reaction. This is X, sorry. This is X. No reaction, then no reaction. Then iodine and bromine. So still, iodine is less reactive than bromine, so there will be no reaction. So if they ask you about metal, it will be the same thing. The more reactive will kick, will, will remove, will replace the one that is less reactive. Any question? No question? Okay. Next, let's proceed. So then, these are the factors that can affect the chemical reaction. Concentration, temperature, and particle size. Now, I told, as I told you earlier, reaction can be faster, reaction can be slower. It depends on the, on the temperature, concentration, and surface area like that. Now, look at this question. The original experiment was repeated with a higher temperature. So describe and explain in terms of collision between particles, the effect of using higher temperature on the time taken for the reaction to finish. What do you think will happen if the temperature is higher? Will it be faster or slower? Okay, yeah, correct. So time taken will be slow. Uh, time taken will be less, so it means it is faster than particles because it has more energy, so it can move faster. Then if it's moving faster, if the particles are moving faster, there will be more collision. There will be more collision. So more collision, there will be faster, or there will be more chemical reactions that will happen. So more collisions have energy greater than the activation energy. That's why chemical reaction will be faster. Activation energy is the energy you need to or for the chemical reaction to occur. You need energy for the chemical reaction to occur. So activation energy is the energy needed for that chemical reaction to happen. Okay. Okay. 
Next. So for the redox reaction and then acids and bases, I think this one is easy. It's just pH one to six, weak acid, strong acid, like that. Then you have properties of bases. I think this one is easy also because you just have to know the pH. Then strong acid, I mean strong alkaline, completely ionized, weak alkaline, partially ionized. And for this one, you know this one also. So we can proceed to the next one. So types of oxide. Metal oxide are basic oxide. Okay, example, so iron, magnesium, sodium oxide. So those oxides are basic oxide. Non-metal oxides are usually acidic oxide, sulfur oxide, carbon dioxide. But there are substances which can be considered as amphoteric or which are amphoteric oxides. When you said amphoteric, I emphasize this one because it is a common topic to the question in IG, especially paper four. Amphoteric means can react with acids and alkali. Metal oxides or basic oxides can react with acids. Non-metal oxides can re or acidic oxides can react with bases or alkali. But amphoteric, amphoteric oxides react with both it reacts with both acids and alkali. So the examples of that are aluminum oxide, zinc oxide, and lead oxide. Okay. Then oxides which are neither acidic or basic, meaning they don't react with uh, alkali and acid. So you have water and carbon monoxide. I saw questions like this, especially in paper two. Which oxide of carbon is neutral? Which oxide of carbon is neutral? So that is carbon monoxide because carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is acidic so they're asking which oxide of carbon is neutral so that is carbon monoxide okay so the periodic table you know to the left metal to the right non metal you know that one already now let's try this one part of the periodic table is shown which element forms an acidic oxide so of course, acidic oxide, these are non-metal. So it should be non-metal oxide. Non-metal oxide. So what is this one? Non-metal oxide. Okay, so that is letter B. Very good. Because B is a non-metal. Okay, so it's just like that. Okay. The next properties of metals, the physical properties. So these are basic already. So you can just simply look at that one. Then transition metal. I think you observed this one also. This is very common uh, question. Differentiate elements in group or metals in group one with transition metals. I'm going to show you the question like this one. Group one metals are very reactive. Transition metals are also metals, but are less reactive than group one metals. So state two physical properties. Again, eh, this kind of question I saw several times in the exam. Okay. So State two physical properties of group one metal, which are similar to those transition metals. Look, physical properties. Sometimes they uh, specify whether it is physical or chemical. Sometimes they're just asking state two properties like that. If they said state two properties, it could be physical or chemical. But if it's physical, stated as physical, you have to write physical. So you can write the shiny. Malleable, sonorous, like that. Okay, you can write also conduct electricity and heat. Conduct electricity and heat. Like this one. For differences, differences, again, it is asking for physical properties. Okay, so differences, you know that group one, group one has less density or lower density. Then group two, I mean number two, group one has lower melting point and boiling point. Okay, so again, it's specified as physical property. If you write here, it can be used as catalyst, uh, different oxidation number, 
can form colored compounds, so those answers will be wrong. It will not be considered. Okay, so you have to look at the question. If it's asking physical, answer physical. If they are asking chemical, you have to write chemical properties. Okay. The next is extraction of metal. So for this extraction of metals, I have shown you for aluminum already. So no need for this one. Okay. Let's try this one. State the name of the zinc ore. Okay, zinc is extracted from an ore containing zinc sulfide. So what do you call the, uh, the ore of zinc? By the way, if you're going to write, so please stop calling me a cute zebra. I like her call smart goat. You will see zinc here. It is below carbon. So you will use reduction with carbon. You will use here reduction with carbon. Okay. So reduction with carbon because it's lower than carbon. So for this one, it is zinc blend. Zinc. Yes. Okay, then write a chemical equation for the reaction of zinc oxide with carbon. So you just have to write chemical equation again, uh, chemical equation, not word equation. If you write word equation, even if your answer is correct, they will not consider. So you have to write that chemical equation zinc oxide, zinc oxide plus carbon. So you'll have to add carbon plus carbon. Then it will produce zinc. It, the carbon will remove the zinc because carbon is more reactive. Then plus, you can write CO2. It's CO2. So it is CO2, so you have to put two in front of zinc. You have to balance. Then you have to put two in front of this. Just like that. Okay. No two for carbon, no need. Because there is only one carbon here on the product. So there should be one carbon also on the reactor. Then last, state what type of chemical change happens to the zinc in zinc oxide. Look at this one. Zinc oxide becomes zinc. It removes the oxygen. So what kind of reaction is this? Is this? Oxidation reaction or reduction reaction? Reduction or oxidation? This is okay, very good. It is reduction. Why is it reduction reaction? Okay, it removes oxygen. Nice one. So remove oxygen. Oxygen is removed. Okay, right there, so, so, this one. so that's zinc blend. Then reduction, so oxygen is lost. Or removal of oxygen. Or oxygen is removed. Okay. I think it's time already. Okay, so that's all for today. If we still have time, we will continue discussing the other topics. Okay, students. And if you still have any questions regarding the previous topics that we discussed, you can message me directly. Uh, to my WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.